Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. I'm joined today by fish ecologist Steve Crawford and chief of the Peskatomagadi Nation, Hugh Akaji. Thank you both for being here today to discuss white sharks. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Steve, can we talk a little bit about you at the University of Guelph as a professor? What did start your research though with white sharks and how did it bring you to this part of the world? The connection with white sharks actually started when I was a kid because um, I got a series of books from my parents. Chief probably rec remembers them. The Jacques Cousteau uh, Wonderful Ocean series. They were the white and green books and there were I think 12 or 13 of them. And I'm pretty sure that that was the first time that I saw a white shark and I was very mm. young, like six or seven years old. And I, after that I was just hooked and so I had white shark posters all over the place. And then I was around nine or ten when I was in the back seat of my dad's Buick, our family was going down to Florida for winter vacation, and I was sitting in the back seat with a book that I probably should not have been reading because it was petrifying me, mm. and it was Jaws. And uh -huh. the thing that Benchley did in there that I blew me away was he wrote part of that book from the shark's perspective, mm. and I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know that you could put yourself into a non-human <laughs> living creature and this is long before I had met indigenous people in Canada where you know there's very much a more brother and sister relationship with the other organisms but Chief's the guy to talk about that. Can we talk a little bit about first of the white shark knowledge system research project that you started that before you got to this part of the world brought you to New Zealand. Yeah. Um, can you talk about what it is exactly and, and what you're looking for with this research? The faculty position that I've got at the University of Guelph was created by the Chippewas of Nawash. So they communicated with the university. I was working full time for NAWASH on fisheries ecology issues. So they got into discussion with the university to create a faculty position where I would work on other things. And the old people in the community specifically said that they wanted me to work from the science side on improving engagement between indigenous and science knowledge holders. I didn't have any background in sociology or anything, but I figured, okay, I'll do my best on that. We worked on knowledge system, basically trying to go through all the literature and stuff like that. And it, a lot of it is very hard to read, very mm -hmm. hard to understand. We came up with a framework, my colleague Gigi Varghese is a sociologist, and we came up with a framework uh, about how to think about knowledge. Most people don't think about thinking, they mm -hmm. just think. And if you're gonna have discussion between indigenous and local and science knowledge holders, they need to kind of explain to each other how it is that they know about the world mm -hmm. and how they learn and how they transmit that knowledge across generations. So we had the framework and uh, because of the faculty position, when you are tenured, they give you a sabbatical. So I knew I had to go someplace and I figured, why not go back to little Steve Crawford in the backseat of the Buick? Why not invest in a research project that combined the knowledge system research with the white sharks? Mm. The Saugino Ojibwe had already been down to New Zealand, I don't know, maybe five or six times I'd been with them because there was an Ojibwe Maori collaboration on environmental assessments and knowledge and that type of thing. So I had some connections and I knew that New Zealand had a very healthy white shark population. So I took the sabbatical and I went down there and I worked for six months going around the south end of the South Island trying to find the people that were most knowledgeable about the waters in general and the sharks in particular. And the 65 people that agreed to be interviewed by me, more of a discussion than an interview, they agreed also that when I sent them back the transcript, they approved it for public release. So that's what's on that White Pointer Chronicles website. Wow. And that was 65 people that I interviewed in five or six months when I was in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. This is my last, my best before date. I retire October 2025. I've got one final sabbatical, so I figured why not give back to my countries, the USA and Canada, and do the same thing, but for the Northwest Atlantic white shark population. Okay. So and it starts in Florida and in the Keys, and it goes all the way up to Labrador. When we're looking at the Passamaquoddy Bay in particular, Chief, um, what I was reading today is that about 200 white sharks approximately might pass through here any given season. Um, what do we know about the white shark in this area? Well, I have to turn myself in. I'm not an expert on white sharks, and the honest truth is growing up in this area years ago, we never heard about the white shark, never talked about them, and I didn't grow up on the reserve, so I don't have the benefit of 
hearing from uh, elders any stories about the white shark. But I, I do remember in my childhood, childhood, um, many years ago, <laughs> that uh, we encountered the white shark in different ways. My, my experience goes back to Peter Benchley, Jaws, and it was just like uh, hearing drums if you're an Indian, somebody's coming to scalp you well. If I heard bum 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 bum, then get away from the water, there's a white shark out there. I had that fear, but it also created a passion, something like yourself, but not quite. It was um, reading stories about shark attacks in the area. So I read pretty well every book about a shark attack in this area. I also found it interesting that at that point in time, and you'll probably correct me, I think the most northern shark attack was off Cape Breton. Right. Um, it was um, a couple of guys in a, a dory, and they never did find the shark and, or the guys, but the dory actually had a white shark tooth in it, and they credit that as being, at the time, the uh, uh, most uh, northern shark attack. But from that, I was reading about the tiger shark down in uh, Hudson, the Hudson area. I was reading about and I was just enthralled by the whole story of, uh, well, I guess it's that, that fear-driven need to know mm -hmm. of all of this. Not connecting it with the bay itself until somewhere in my biology career, biological station career, I should say, someone reported a shark in a weir in Dedmans Harbor. And uh, the story at the time was how the fishermen were in the weir and they were taunting the shark, poking it with oars and whatever, whatever. And they got quite a scare because the next morning when the tide went out, this 17-foot great white shark was beached right at the mouth of the weir. And apparently that created quite a, a commotion. A lot of people in the area now have white shark teeth, etc., etc. Mm. And they have the stories. But a 17-foot great white Back when Peter Benchley was talking about it, he created this 25 foot, and everybody said, that's massive. There, there'll never be a great white shark, you know, that size, whatever, whatever. And I'm thinking, 17 feet's close enough. So I was quite impressed with this creature. Again, um, I only have the, the stories that come, just like everybody else's stories, through books and uh, uh, literature that I've read. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, the horror stories. But I do remember Peter Benchley trying to correct um, what he thought was uh, a very poor image that he was part, if not responsible for, partly responsible for. And that impressed me to uh, any great extent. We also had rumors, but there were simply rumors at the time. Uh, going on at the biological station, that there was a white shark resident population in Passamaquoddy Bay. Mm. I never saw evidence, I never saw the proof, I just heard that mm -hmm. there was that resident population. And of course then you fast forward to a couple of years ago and a white shark circling your canoe and I guess you have uh, a return of interest and, and excitement, but yeah. Well, it'd be nice to see the truth. It'd be nice to see the whole story. So, uh, when you finish with your book, I'll, <laughs> I'll enjoy it. <laughs> I think what is fascinating from just me getting to know your research today is that by doing talks with people like Chief Akaji, from hearing about people with real life experiences of white sharks, you've been able to debunk a lot of things that mm -hmm. we previously thought about the white shark. Um, mm -hmm. One very groundbreaking part of your research has to do with uh, mating rituals of the white shark that uh, I suppose, I think I know this from the Nature Channel, I thought I mm -hmm. knew that the white shark went out into deep waters to mate, but from talking to people, you've shown that it's in shallow waters and that we had this all wrong. It, it's a, a little bit of context here. There were people in the science community that were treating uh, mating with great white sharks as being the holy grail because nobody had ever seen it. There was one reference, it was a paragraph long in the scientific literature from 1995 about a woman in New Zealand who was, she was being employed by the Department of Conservation to d assess the seal population 
But as she was doing that, she's up high on a cliff, and she's doing her counts or whatever, and she sees these two big white sharks, and at first she thought they were fighting, and because one animal was biting the other mm. one. And then she said, and this is all in just like four sentences, and then she said, but one turned the other one over, and somehow they got connected, and they started rolling over and over, and that was it. That's yeah. all mm. science knew about mating. With the advent of the satellite tags, uh, we now know that, especially in the Pacific Ocean, those white sharks go off into the middle of the Pacific, and we can't follow them there. And they do crazy things, they can tell because of the pressure uh, sensors in the tags, that they're diving down to 500, 600 feet. So there was a bunch of scientists that figured, well, that must be where courtship and mating takes place. Yeah. But when it, one of the 65 people that I interviewed in New Zealand, he actually didn't want to be interviewed at all hmm. because they've got this controversy about the uh, cage tour dive operations down there. Mm -hmm. But he was a retired, extremely well-respected fisherman, and he insisted that I come back every two weeks to have tea with him so that <laughs> I could tell him who I interviewed and what they said. And then one day after tea, he said, by the way, Steve, did I ever tell you about the time we saw white sharks mating out here in Otago Harbor? And I looked at him and I said, Dick, nobody's ever seen that. <laughs> so he allowed me to take his story down about that. And it's just uh, before I came down on this main uh, mm -hmm. New Brunswick component of the research project, just got sent off for publication as an example of scientists need examples so that they can see the benefit of engaging with people who have spent their entire culture, spent their entire lives on the water. Mm -hmm. And if they can move their minds out of the labs, um, because a lot of scientists, you know, they maybe get two or three weeks field season. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting across the table from somebody who spent 65 years, you know? <laughs> so taking that as an example to provide to the people in my own science knowledge system, that's what this is all about. And this is kind of a question for both of you. When you take something like that knowledge that you got from speaking with people who experienced the white shark, when we're looking at a species like the white shark that is endangered, Having that knowledge, does that change, can that drastically change our conservation efforts? If we know shallow water is suddenly so important for mating, what can that do for how we help allow this creature to survive? It's a good question down in Florida. One of the things that I wanted to do was document when the white sharks are there, how often they are, and what kind of habitats and how they behave. And one thing that seems pretty consistent so far down on the southern end of the range is that they are infrequent visitors, they're very curious, uh, but they're not, rea they're not really around and they don't hang around very much. To get back to Dickie's story, when he saw, he and his mate saw them, they were in the middle of Otago Harbor, 14 feet of water on sand. That doesn't mean that they have to mate there. Okay. That doesn't mean that when they copulate it has to be that shallow or sandy, but it means that they can. And it may also be that there's still an offshore component to it, hmm. but I think Dick's observation probably changes the way that we should be looking at our coastline. Because if these animals are coming through on a regular seasonal migration, as they do, they come up north, and we know that they come up to feed because uh, places that have seal rookeries, whether they're harbor seals or gray seals, um, and there are people who recognize individual animals as hanging around in that place, mm. well, it's possible that those males may be setting up these courtship mating territories, enticing mm. the females to come in. If that's the case, that's a component of their behavior that we didn't know anything about. Wow. Because everybody in the science, most people in the science knowledge system, they just kind of accepted the idea that white sharks were not territorial. Well, it might be that they are for certain periods of time. And I think the key there is Passamaquoddy Bay, Nova Scotia, Sable Island, Cape Breton, if these are destinations for the reproductively mature males and females, and if the males are setting up these territories, I think it's our responsibility as humans to keep an eye out for them, find out if they're doing this, and then stay away from them during the season. Right. Hmm. You know, partly for their purpose, we don't want to be interrupting them, but we probably should be telling people not to kayak around there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the male shark might treat a human in the water mm -hmm. like it would treat another male white shark right. and just hmm. chase it out of the way. Now, aside from hmm. maybe science, maybe not looking at the full picture at times. We also have pop culture. Um, typecasting the white shark is often this this one-track minded, very dangerous predator. Um, we know that's not the case. You mentioned the word curious um, as, as, a, as a 
part of their personality. What else are we not getting the full picture of and, and what can people that do experience the white shark tell us about who they really are? I'd say there were probably three things that I learned about the behavior of white sharks from the experts in New Zealand and they're, it's being reinforced in the interviews on this project with the Northwest Atlantic. The Kiwis had this phrase, it took me a little while to figure out what, what the hell they meant by it because they kept saying, these sharks are not silly. And I didn't really mm. know what that meant until one of them explained, it means they're really smart, Steve. And when mm. I interviewed the cage tour dive operators, um, they got to know these individual white sharks. Uh, I mean, they'd see them near daily for weeks at a time, and then the sharks would move off in their migration and come back. And they got to mm. see them and know them over the years. These white sharks have individual personalities. and. When you see an animal over a broader period of time, and it's no longer just you know, the, the apex predator, bloodthirsty, all that, if it's possible that we could conceive that these are the shark people, that these are individual personalities that we're dealing with, then perhaps we understand them a little bit differently in relationship to uh, how they perceive us. Mm -hmm. Another thing that came up, especially from the, they have a abalone they call uh, powas um, in New Zealand. And the power divers would describe the idea that these animals would come up behind them if there were two divers. And one diver wouldn't even know it was there. And it was just, it's what they called a swim by. Mm. They are <laughs> incredibly well tuned. They know uh, their environment. All of that sensory gear that they've got on the front and the sides of them. I mean, it's highly unlikely that they would mistake a human being for anything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there was an attack, and I don't know if you heard about the attack took place a couple of years ago in Maine, it shocked everybody. It was the first ever, you were talking about one of the most northern presumed attacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a woman that had retired from New York. She was a fashion executive, and she swam in the ocean every day. She was out there with her daughter, and it was not near a seal colony. It was in a harbor with a bunch of boats mm. on Sandy Bottom. And it's quite possible that that particular shark attacked that particular person, not because of mistaken identity, but once again, potentially, because that person was in a place that that shark felt that person should not be. Wow. Mm. And if that's happening in Passamaquoddy Bay, or if that's happening off the coast of Nova Scotia, or up around Cape Breton, I think maybe we need to know a little bit more about that. So we should take that instance more seriously and look into that moment. And mm. That's one of the reasons why I'm asking people around Passamaquoddy to contact me if they have seen white sharks in Passamaquoddy. I mean, we know they're there. I interviewed uh, Mark Trudeau. He's a biologist at the biological station, DFO. Okay. And he's responsible for the... Um, they have two different types of tags on the white sharks mm -hmm. in the Northwest Atlantic. They've got satellite tags and uh, acoustic telemetry pingers. Mm -hmm. And there is a, an array of receivers, of ears, that are out in Passamaquoddy. And Mark was showing me his preliminary results. I mean, they're looking on the order of 50 tagged animals in Passamaquoddy, different yeah. individuals. <laughs> and the crazy thing is that more people do not see them. Hmm. I mean, yeah. you get some reports from the Eastport side or uh, Danielle Dion on the Quaddy Link, mm -hmm. you know, that they'll hmm. see a white shark on occasion take a porpoise or a seal. Yeah. Uh, and it's a big deal, right? But when you figure that for every animal that has one of those pingers on it, there's probably another mm -hmm. at least 10 that don't. Mm -hmm. and we don't see them, right? Yeah. I keep asking people, we were at Latie Passage today with our students. Mm -hmm. We saw minke whales, we saw mm -hmm. uh, seals, we saw all sorts of birds, and mm -hmm. you just don't see these big jaws-like caudal fins. It definitely mm -hmm. makes or, uh, the dorsal news. Fins. It makes it, there was Pat Barker, do you remember that, Chief? Uh, Pat Barker was canoeing a few years back. I will give you a number if you haven't reached out to her yet. Mm -hmm. um, because you posted your thing on social media, she got in touch mm -hmm. with me. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. That's what we do here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you tell me, Chief, though, a little bit about the history of the Pescatomagadi Nation and the white shark? Does it, is there a relationship that goes way back, and is it different from the ideas we have of white sharks today? I wish I could give you that kind of information. I really do not have it. As a matter of fact, uh, you're sort of triggering a lot of questions. <laughs> um, have you had a chance to look at, I'm s and sorry I'm passing it off, but uh, have you had a chance to look at any um, uh, archaeological records, the digs, the, the middens? The, do we have any information as to what were in the middens? Because this is where we get a lot of our 
history from the past, from uh, uh, shark teeth or uh, any any part of an animal. I think uh, scoot from the sturgeons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you, do we have any? There's a little bit. Yeah. I have a there's a friend of mine. He's a colleague. He's a, an archaeologist, and I don't really know much about archaeology. Mm -hmm. I know that a part of his project was going through the records that have been accumulated by the archaeologists mm -hmm. from the old days where they were they were digging up stuff without contacting people in the communities and mm -hmm. they were basically in the process of giving back to the communities mm -hmm. both the artifacts but also trying to do in a respectful way uh, communicating mm -hmm. and one of the things that Matt uh, found based on the archaeological digs was that there were some indigenous grave sites that were special uh, in different ways and one of the ways that they were special was that uh, indigenous people in this region, broadly, mm -hmm. were burying people with white shark teeth. Mm -hmm. And what really blew me away was he's, he's got a map that he shows uh, where he lays out not just the uh, white shark teeth, but also, you know, the megalodon, the ancestor of the great white shark, oh. the one that's about 60 or 70 feet? Yeah, I know what you mean. Indigenous people were burying megalodon teeth oh in some of these burial sites oh as well. Mm -hmm. And it is just impossible to imagine that the ancestral people that were here mm -hmm. didn't have some type of a deep cultural bond with the white sharks. Mm -hmm. And where that goes and the kind of communication discussions that we have, he said when he was in the session, we had a Zoom session, he was describing it, he wanted to give back, he wanted to ask questions because another part of it was that that entire practice uh, stopped after yeah. colonization. So the disruption of the, the ways that things had been done, and he wanted to ask the people in the community, and in a similar kind of way, Chief, if I understand the way that Matt told me about this, he said, you're telling us something that we don't know, mm -hmm. because some of our history channels, our history channels, some of our, <laughs> our history, mm -hmm. our connections back to those days, they're quite fractured. Hmm. Yeah. Well, can you tell me a bit about what you've learned on this trip in this part of the world from talking to people that live here now. What have been some of the most thought-provoking encounters people have had and, and knowledge that they've garnered from their own interactions or just sightings of white sharks? What are you taking mm -hmm. away from this visit to this region? I know that you've, what's That's fascinating is that you've been to Kepabello. Every time I've tried to get him here, <laughs> he's been somewhere talking to people, which is so refreshing um, in terms of your research, but I'd love to know what you've heard. There's probably, if I were to think of the top three, the first one would be Cutler. There's something about the Western Passage, because when I checked, I spent a fair bit of time working with lobstermen and divers and charter operators along the main coastline, working my, what they call down east. And it was, yes, occasionally, and here's a seal with an obvious shark bite out of it. But when you get to the Western Passage, the Quadi uh, Passage, things change. So mm -hmm. there is something about this bay that is drawing the white sharks in. Mm -hmm. And I have a very strong feeling that it is a combination of habitat, uh, whether it's because the sandy areas that would be in here combined with the food source. I have a feeling also that these animals, they have a very strong sense of fidelity. They will make migrations and come back to exactly the same mm. spot. Mm. So this is something that in the white shark culture may actually get passed down from generation to generation. And the juveniles might accompany the adults that come up here. One thing that I didn't appreciate until I was working around the Cobbs Cook area was that there's an article that came up by a guy named Molimo, Paul Molimo. He published it in the Northeastern Naturalist. Mm -hmm. And he, and this is back in 1995 or 1998, mm -hmm. and he wrote about how, you, you know what you said before about there are a lot more white sharks than we give credit for being. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they were being just as busy with other things back then. But he documented these same types of things like attacks on dories or interactions. And one of the examples that he gave was a white shark, a rather large female, and Dr. Scott from the St. Andrews Biological Station positively mm -hmm. identified it and mm -hmm. confirmed that this large animal was a female mm -hmm. and that it had a courtship bite on it. 
So it had either been courting nearby mm -hmm. or in the not too, I mean, they can travel great distances, mm -hmm. but he was of the opinion and Malamos, he ended that section saying, is it possible that Passamaquoddy Bay is a mating hotspot? And I <laughs> think he's onto something. Wow. And I think it's just mm -hmm. a matter of time. And then I'll just keep knocking on doors until at some point in time, I'm going to say, has anybody seen like more than one white shark at a time? Mm -hmm. Have you seen them? Maybe they look like they were fighting and it's no, no, no. And then at some point, somebody's going to say, I haven't, but I think you need to talk to my uncle mm -hmm. because maybe there's a story that he remembers and it could even be from his previous generation. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. might see these things only so rarely. Well, I w it was so glad to hear just now that, that people got in touch with you. We just posted about your research because we thought it was fascinating, hoping it would get some more people involved. But it's, let's say someone wants to reach out to you now. Maybe you're going back to Ontario at some point soon. But um, how do they do it, and, and where can they share their story and information with you? I think probably the simplest and the best thing is if they check the New Zealand website because they can see how the project will be uh, once I've done all of the interviews and had them transcribed and approved and put up on a, on a website for the Northwest Atlantic. But my contact information, my email address is my best way to get a hold of me. You talk about mm. the fidelity of the white shark to areas and, and its own traditions. Why are you so loyal to this topic and what do you hope um, that it does, this research that you're doing to either change things for the white shark in terms of its endangered status um, or for just our knowledge as humans about another species? Well, one thing that I learned from working with the Chippewas and Awash is what you do as a professional scientist is great, but you have to give back to the communities. And I'm at the stage in my career where I've got a chance and a little bit of freedom to be able to um, give back by recognizing and respecting what it is that the indigenous and local knowledge holders have. There are a bunch of young scientists who need a good role model maybe or know that it's possible to do work like that. So I guess that's one thing, giving back. Second thing is I think that these animals in the Northwest Atlantic population are as equally complex as the animals in the New Zealand population. And I think that this will probably serve as uh, not just enhancing public education, but providing my science colleagues with new hypotheses that they can explore. And then the last thing is just I'm going full circle because what better way for me to end my career, this is the selfish part, uh, <laughs> than to go back to little Steve Crawford sitting in the back seat of the Buick reading Jaws, but maybe coming at it from a different direction. Well, I thank you both <laughs> so much for coming and taking the time to do this today, telling us more in it, and I hope that our area from watching this will keep this dialogue open and that you will come back and sit down with us again. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief. My guests today have been Steve Crawford and Chief Hugh Akji. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO Television.